I never chose history as a subject in secondary school, so my greater knowledge of events are stuck in a year 9 and under demographic, along with whatever I've learnt post-adulthood on YouTube, or previously the Discovery slash History channel, whenever I've found a great film that covers a historical event. But one part of early history I've always loved is the tale of succession that happened in 1066, basically the birth of our great British Empire. There's something unique about growing up in the black country during this modern era as you really can't see fully the last vestiges of our empire and the decimation of the industrial revolution which brought about a great nation's collapse. I can look out the bedroom window in me, post-war mid-terrace council house built to as a grown population of miners and steel workers, and see the remnants of our past in Cobb's engine house, Netherton Tunnel, and Dudley's ruined castle just off in the distance, with our old coal mine knowingly just over the hill. Gardens around here can often sink into the ground sometimes, and even recently there was a story about a piece of land that just couldn't be built upon due to an old mine shaft being discovered underneath. See, history is everywhere if you care to pay attention in the UK, but I only really listened when it come to the Romans, Vikings and 1066 in school. Guess I've always liked conquering empires. Suppose that's what happens when you live in one. But I especially love the latter of these three choices as it had the makings of a great fantasy novel with four claimants and three nations basically fighting over a crown. A conflict this deck builder encapsulates fully with beautifully drawn cards and a very short playtime. The aim of 1066 Tears to Many Mothers is to win at the Battle of Hastings. In the game you have three wedges to fight over, one left, one centre, one right, politics at its finest, and you have nine slots to fill up with cards to assist you to gain the advantage, not just in the main battle, but also in the preparations for the battle, as you start some months before round, and it's a race for both teams to muster their forces using might and zeal. So at the start of the game, you place your leader, Harold or Willie, a good old red versus blue encounter, in one of the three locations, they grant some really good buffs, so... It's not always best to place them head to head, especially when you both have to claim two of the wedges to win the game, unless you really want to counter each other and believe your cards will assist with claiming the other wedges. After placing your leader though, you draw five cards from the shuffle deck and then work out if you can place them on the board. New and all cards have a cost and to place them in one of the three rows you have to either discard a number of cards from your hand to pay it or you can tie a cards that grant points on the board to place one down at the cost of not being able to use the zeal or might that card grants until next turn. Anywhere you place a card putting it on the front row if it's empty or behind the other card in the same row if it's A. Your opponent then places a card and it goes back and forth until someone passes, at which point your opponent can continue to place cards until they pass. At the end of your placement you add up the zeal and might on your cards that are not tired and match the number to the, the number on your quest. So if a quest has three might on its card and you have seven might on the board, you add four pips to that card as that is the difference and the quest usually needs six pips to complete it so sometimes two or three turns are needed to complete early quests. Harold starts with needing might before swapping to needing zeal halfway through with Willie getting the opposite and thus that is your race to the Battle of Hastings and that is it for describing the base gameplay. Once you reach Hastings though, you are only allowed to use zeal advantages to place pips on the wedges until your opponent eventually turns up to the battle. Usually someone's late and your bloke's left hanging around doing nothing. But once the battle between your booth starts, you match up your might advantages for all three wedges and place the difference on each wedge with you gaining one more bonus pip if you win the zeal battle on each wedge. 
The first one to gain 10 pips on a wedge wins it. And if you claim two, you win the game. But if you kill your opposing leader at any point during in the game, you can instantly win it that way also, along with one of you emptying your deck completely, but believe me, both of those are pretty difficult to do, especially emptying a deck of about 80 cards. You mucked up pretty bad if you do. Now, tactically, it's not always about placing just soldiers, as you do get tactics cards to slow down your opponent or give your army buffs, and you also have battlements which can be attached to wedges to give yourself a bonus. I am also a fan of the arrow in the eye style cards which runes Harold, as it means there's plenty tactical gameplay choices, along with a huge deck of cards that means no game should really be the same. Now that is the basics gameplay for a 1 versus 1 or Kageondid match, but one of the best parts of this game is the fact it also has an inbuilt solo AI mode coming in a second dedicated rulebook so you can play with both armies against each other with the AI acting very well over three difficulty settings. Easy or so simple you just call lose mode. Medium the difficulty you should be playing at when you're learning how to play and hard or as it's known the actual game mode you should really be playing at because the difficulty determines how much points the AI can spend each time to spawn a card with the points going up the more rounds you play thus creating the tactical nuance of the rest of the battle of air scenes on top of some gameplay I've already described. The only difference is really is the fact that the AI can never lose by emptying its deck as you just keep cycling through it to find a card that matches the amount they can spend that round. So its side of the board can fill up pretty fast with it also starting with a predetermined number of cards depending on opponent and it placing each of the drawn cards in select places replacing cards as the 9 square area fills up. The objective is still to claim two out of the three wedges or pop the enemy's leader to win, but now you also get given points for your performance, thus granting you a beat your old score draw to hopefully pull you back in once more. With the ice score being the ultimate of run-throughs for you to beat, as you not just have to get to Hastings, but also win one wedge and get seven to eight points on the other wedges before killing the opposing leader to win the game. A goal I'm sure many people will be interested in as it would require a load of luck on a perfect run through but alas it's not one I'm ever going to be interested in doing as whilst this game is good I just feel like I'm never going to ever play it ever again because other than beating the ridiculous high score I've kind of experienced everything that this game has to offer in just seven playthroughs and that's this game's biggest disappointment for me. I played once on easy, twice on medium, three times on hard and did one Kagi on did playthrough where I played both sides to the best of their abilities and that's all this game has to offer. It's a uh, one versus one for bragging rights or against an AI on one of the three difficulties to beat your score and now the higher the difficulty it doesn't grant you more points so if you're going for the max score I'm sure many will just do it on easy and call it a day but with a game only taking 20-30 minutes to play, you can't get 3-4 games in during a session if you wanted. I myself played to a time with the last Kageondid game being on its own just to try it out and I really enjoyed this game, don't get me wrong, it's fun, easy to learn and teach, you don't get muddled halfway through and find yourself constantly looking through the rule book. the artwork on the cards is amazing, along with the fully researched blurbs underneath the card pictures and often rules which mean you get bonuses, please remember those as they do help a lot, there is so much history of the battle on offer here, some of the art looks like Hollywood actors like Clive Owen so it ends up feeling cinematic and I really did struggle making tactical choices against the AI on hard difficulty as I wanted to play the right cards in the right order to get a perfect run. I only beat the AI on hard on my last run but 
I generally don't have any desire to play this game ever again. And I can't really see people picking this up, playing it a couple of times, then dumping it on a shelf for two, three years before playing it only once or twice again. It really saddens me to say that it has less legs than Lieutenant Dan in Forrest Gump, especially with the fact I paid 30 quid for this thing second on with the playmat. But I can't help but shag the feeling of wasting my money on this, especially as I'm really trying to maximise getting the most value out of my board games lately, so £4.30 a game for me isn't maximising the value of what I played, and there's no point owning a 30 quid shelf filler that will basically never get touched again, so I'm going to be selling this on, I think, because... It just a for me but the game here under the engine is good as i said the art is beautiful and worth the price of this alone if you're really into that there was a lot of time and energy put into crafting the historical figures and flavor on the cards people will appreciate this game and no doubt enjoy playing it from time to time i just feel i've experienced everything already and the money from selling this could be better spent elsewhere. The components are great quality, you get two lots of pip tokens, red and blue for booth armies, and rules are well written with great descriptions of what to do for both the core rules and the solo rules. Yes, it's hard to keep track of the RAND for AI when just using the book itself, hence why they have now created a proper solo dial to keep track of everything along with improving the AI difficulty, I believe. The edition I had was a first print run of this game from the Kickstarter many years ago, so your mileage may vary depending on if you pick up the reprinted version. But the solo AI is very good on the hardest difficulty in this box. I did find it an actual challenge and really had to consider placement of my cards, when to tire or discard, and when to fire my archers basically the only way to do damage to your opponent's cards. Building your deck of fighters on that 9 square battle mat will no doubt be great for enthusiasts of crunchy, must be perfect run gameplay, but there's still a lot of luck of the draw mechanics, especially with you having such a huge deck that could also be disappointing for some people. Luckily there's some cardboard tokens for you to keep track of gameplay buffs you earn from selected cards and it all fits back into the box easily with just a couple of baggies but for me there's just better deck builders out there personally and I will honestly be never be playing this again so please do your due diligence if you're considering picking it up try and get the reprinted version also if you do but mostly thanks for watching